All right, breaking now, a group of progressive Democrats is withdrawing a recent letter that calls on President Biden to shift his Ukraine strategy. The letter urging him to negotiate with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Now from Capitol Hill, Newsmax congressional correspondent Kelmany Ducart here with an update. Kelmany, are you hearing any word on why Dems are actually going back on this? Yeah, Bianca, John, studying developments here, that letter released by 30 members of the House Progressive Caucus on Monday, adding to a lot of questions about why this letter was released now when it was actually drafted back in June. We have heard from the House Progressive Caucus Chair Pramila Jayapal, who has now retracted that letter, saying it was draft, drafted months ago and released by staff without vetting. Uh, but the contents of that letter has been startling, particularly for some. The letter warns of a prolonged conflict in Ukraine and says, we urge you to pair the military and economic support the United States has provided to Ukraine a proactive diplomatic push, redoubling efforts to seek a realistic framework for a ceasefire. It goes on to say, with Congress already approving tens of billions of dollars in funding for Ukraine, legislators have a responsibility for the United States to seriously explore all possible avenues, including direct engagement with Russia to reduce harm and support Ukraine in achieving a peaceful settlement. That received immediate backlash. One Democrat Democratic congressman says it's a quote olive branch to a war criminal who's losing his war. Ukraine is on the march. Congress should be standing firm behind Joe Biden's effective strategy, including tighter, not weaker sanctions. And another one of its signatories, Mark Pocan, rushed to clarify, saying, first, this was written in July, and I have no idea why it went out now. Bad timing. Second, it was trying to get a ceasefire in diplomacy as others were banging war drums, not criticizing Biden. Third, I've supported the efforts and I'll continue overanalyzed by some. And another progressive caucus member, uh, Congressman Mark Takano, released a statement offering his continued assurances for Ukraine. Uh, it was interesting, though, the fact that this letter has now been retracted by the House Progressive Caucus Chair Pramila Jayapal because she had issued a statement of clarification a few hours after that letter was sent out saying, we are united as Democrats in our unequivocal commitment to supporting Ukraine in their fight for democracy and freedom. Well, this letter was supposed to be released August 1st. John and Bianca, we talk about this all the time. We pull up tweets that don't age well or sound bites that don't age well. Let's call this letters that don't age well because this is really a much different position than Ukraine and Russia are in right now, particularly with the United States. A lot of people have cited the ongoing uh, threats of nuclear aggression potentially coming from Russia. Uh, so they've acknowledged that this is not the time for negotiation. This letter clearly very outdated and the House Progressive uh, Caucus retracting it just a short time ago. Certainly is curious and maybe more we'll be hearing about this, I think. Uh, Kimani, thank you. All right, let's talk a little bit more about Putin's war on Ukraine. The New York Post says a blemish on the back of Russian President Vladimir Putin's hand has increased speculation that he is fighting cancer. Now, viewers spotted what appears to be uh, the four track marks or the IV track marks on his right hand. The Kremlin released two versions of a propaganda video of Putin last week, one with the watermarks obscuring mm. the president's hand. You can see that one in the upper right hand corner another image without it and you can see his hand there. Well, this isn't the first time we've had questions about Putin's health. So obviously there's still, uh, you know, the propaganda that comes out and, you know, more concerns about is he actually sick? We don't really know. Um, meantime, on the battlefield, Ukraine's military is saying that forces are advancing on Kershaw and Russia is moving out cash. They also say Moscow installed authorities and injured people are getting out of there. But at the same time, they say Russia is moving in some military resources. They believe it's a sign that Putin wants to stay in the fight there and keep control. Of course, this is the southern port city recently illegally annexed by Russia, but one of the first they took control of. Kershaw today basically cut off from all communication and internet and what Ukrainians truly say is just an effort by Russia to stop Kiev's military there making headway. Well, joining us live right now from Kiev with the very latest, let's get you out to our foreign correspondent, Shelby Wilder. Shelby, great to have you in with us today. Hi, it's great to be with you. Well, we're really following reports here that more Ukrainian children are being forcibly deported to mainland Russia and they're being made 
Russian. Now, this is following a series of investigative reports that have found that Russia is forcibly deporting these children from eastern Ukraine. I'm talking about the four territories uh, that Putin now claims are a part of the Russian Federation. We know that back in May, uh, Putin signed a decree making it easier for Ukrainian children to be given Russian citizenship while making it more difficult for Ukrainians and surviving relatives to get these children back. Now, in an exclusive statement to Newsmax, we know that the United Nations Human Rights Office expressed concern that these children were being moved to the Russian Federation, that their best interests were not at heart by Russia, and that also procedures were not included regarding family reunification in regards to getting those children back to Ukrainian families where they belong. Now, despite alarms being raised over these issues, Russia has made an open effort to increase uh, these forcible relocations and deportations of Ukrainian children. Russia is claiming that these adoptions are an act of generosity. They're trying to say that they're caring for helpless minors. However, exposés have revealed that many of these children were not only lied to about their parents, but they also were given to new families in Russia and Russian citizenship. Some of these children are coming from state homes, from foster care. And we know that Ukraine has said that at least 8,700 Ukrainian children have been forcibly deported since February 24th, when this war began. But many here fear that that number could actually be much higher and in the tens of thousands because we do not have full access to information in these Russian-held territories. Now, Ukraine, along with other international human rights organizations, have said that this is just another example of Russia committing horrific abuses to human rights. And Ukraine, along with various international human rights organizations, have said that they strongly oppose Russia's claims here regarding uh, the deportation of these children and now making them Russian citizens. Both frightening and heartbreaking at the same time. Uh, Shelby, thank you so much. We appreciate that live update. All right, joining us now to discuss more on this is senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, Victoria Coates. Victoria, great to have you with us. Thanks, John. Good to be with you. All right, I want to first talk about this letter and the progressive Democrats who are calling on President Biden to negotiate with Vladimir Putin. Uh, and, it, you know, from some of those Democrats who reject this type of idea, why would anyone now sit down for negotiations with Putin when they are talking about surrendering Kershaw? The Ukrainian military seems to be on the march. Is this an appropriate time uh, to have talks with Vladimir Putin for have, have these peace talks? No, I mean, it really is absurd. And it just shows you how fractured and feckless their conference is in, in the House. And But it also shows you that nobody in the House has any idea what the president's trying to do. There is no strategy. That one congressman who's talking about an effective strategy, heck, I'd love to see it if there is such a thing. But all we've gotten out of the White House is basically crisis management. And what we need is a plan for actual victory now that, as you say, the Ukrainians appear to be winning. This is just appalling timing and just so embarrassing for the House Democrats. Yeah, and it's not it's not me saying it. I mean, that's what our mm -hmm. reporters on the ground say. And we also have these reports. We yesterday we talked about uh, the Russian defense ministry having talks with the U.S. secretary of defense. I mean, for all intents and purposes, Victoria, this is a proxy war, I guess. But it does seem like there's some sort of direct engagement, at least between the United States and Russia. And who has the upper hand now in that relationship? I know you know, it's managing chaos and we don't have a lot of confidence in our commander in chief. But, you know, at this time, it does seem that Vladimir Putin's on the ropes. It really is an unprecedented situation. I don't know of another historical example where the United States was so forward leaning in terms of both military and economic support to a third party conducting conducting their own war and for eight months now. So I think this is something we need to look at very, very closely. And if we are engaged in it, we can't just sort of back into this kind of engagement. We need right. clarity from the president on what our purpose is. And if Ukraine can win, I mean, that is the desirable end state for both Kiev and Washington. And we need to get there, not just sort of grind on in this endless carnage.
And as we do, as you say, grind on, uh, as we're kind of fumbling with our uh, the messaging here, winter is coming and we see a huge energy crisis, especially in Europe, as we've seen, you know, Germany preparing, uh, UK preparing, and France is now giving uh, some uh, energy and, and fuel to, to Germany. Victoria, I mean, this is, seems like it's going to go from bad to worse for people in Europe this winter. It's certainly a, a highly precarious position. And I think, you know, the, the Biden energy policies domestically here in the United States have really crippled our ability to surge our energy production in the face of things like there's recent OPEC cuts. Uh, we are supplying uh, most of the natural gas now to Central Europe. Uh, can we continue to do that over the winter, given what they've done to our energy sector? <laughs> I don't know. And it's, it's a deep concern. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the imperative to get this wrapped up as quickly as possible, uh, I think, is, is on both sides of the Atlantic. All right, Victoria Coates, thanks so much for joining us. Great to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. No crooked, crooked establishment. establishment. None of that twisting, twisting the truth. No talking down don't to me. Don't tell me how to think. Don't tell me how to don't think. Don't tell me how to think. I trust Newsmax. Newsmax. They don't tell, tell me, me how to think. think. They let, let me decide. Newsmax. Real news. For real people.